In the last episode, the Japanese were defeated at the Battle of Hangzhou. Due to the Korean commander Kwan Yul's brave defense and unexpected supplies delivered to them on the Han River. I'm Stefan, and this is Japan at War. A few days before the Battle of Hangzhou, Yi Sun Sin had met up with Wan Kyun to combine their naval forces together. And on the next day, Yi Ki met them and he too combined his fleet with theirs. This combined fleet patrolled the coast until on March 20th, they ran across 10 small Japanese ships near Anshan Island. And if you remember, the Korean fleet at this time was much larger. About 160 ships, in fact. The Japanese vessels were overwhelmed with cannon shot and then sunk. On the 21st, the naval commanders decided that they would launch an attack on a small Japanese force at Incheon. The Japanese at this time were being very cautious and kept their ships close to the shore and in caves. The luring tactics of Yi Sun Sin wouldn't work this time, so he decided to send a message to Kim Song Il, the same man who had been sent to Japan before the war and said that they were no threat and asked him to send troops to attack the Japanese position and force them near their ships, where they would then be able to be destroyed. Kim sent back that he didn't have the men to spare. Instead, Yi raised a small army of his own using civilian volunteers and warrior monks. On the 24th, the assault began with two groups of ships filled with warrior monks, and the civilian volunteers racing towards the shores on either side. The Japanese caught off guard by this tactic raced towards their ship where they were then destroyed by the rest of the Korean Navy. The rest of the Japanese positions started to be blasted away by the Korean cannons and groups of archers from on top of the decks and were able to rain down a hailstorm of arrows. At the end of the day, the Koreans were successful in their amphibious attack and were then able to rescue five prisoners of war. Though it should also be pointed out that one of the Korean ships did capsize during the fighting as two commanders became overeager and collided into each other. Even though this was an incredibly small battle, though the amphibious style attack is actually incredibly interesting, I mention this battle to further emphasize what conditions the Japanese are under. Remember, Hideyoshi's plan was to have his men race through the country and then supply the armies with reinforcements by sea. Just think about the Battle of Hangzhou. Even though Kwan Yul had put up a very brave defense, he was actually about to lose the battle. His men were tired, there were holes in their fortification, and they had pretty much ran out of arrows. Had those ships not appeared behind the fort on the Han to reinforce and resupply, I truly believe Quan would have lost that battle. Now, imagine what would have happened throughout the war if the Japanese had been able to reinforce and resupply their men in that exact same manner. This wouldn't have been just men and weaponry, but food as well. The Korean Navy had made this impossible. So the farther that the Japanese are from the base at Busan, the harder it was to get any of those supplies. The defenders at Seoul were facing major shortages at this time, especially in food. The recent battles in the area had destroyed several fields in which food was grown or could be grown. And there were still several guerrilla attacks being carried out by the Koreans. This made foraging and hunting very dangerous for the Japanese to do. In fact, the Korean army actually launched an assault on the Yongsan warehouse on April 16th using boats to carry out a raid. Nothing came of it though as the Japanese forces in the area were able to resist the raiders. With mounting casualties on their side, the Koreans were forced to abandon the attack. On top of that, there was still several dead bodies all over Seoul, both human and horse. This caused incredible sickness on the side of the Japanese. A Buddhist monk who served under Nabashima Naoshige, named Zetaku, wrote this in his diary about it. Even though the soldiers had stacked the bodies of the dead men, women, 
ox, and horse. No one had bothered to bury them. The smell filled the heavens and seeped into the soil. We were forced to stay under these conditions from March until April. The air had become stale with the smell of the heat of the changing season. The result was many of our men coming down with fever and then dying. Puitomi Hideyoshi, in his headquarters at Nagoya, was starting to receive reports about these conditions at this time. He didn't really seem to understand exactly what circumstances his men were in, though, and wrote back to his commanders that their lack of progress is simply due to a lack of enthusiasm, and they should change this immediately. And either way, he would soon be crossing over to Korea to take charge of the armies, and then they would push forward and be triumphant. It has been some time since this has been mentioned in the series, but a while ago we mentioned that he had postponed his initial landing in July of 1592. Of course, this was due to multiple reasons, his health being one of the major reasons, but one thing that was known was that his next plan to land was in April of 1593. Earlier that year, Hideyoshi had sent two representatives to Seoul to remind them of his arrival, but also promised that he would bring close to 200,000 men with him. And let's be honest, this is almost certainly an exaggeration though. This concerned his commanders, who wrote back in March that there was barely enough food for the armies currently in Seoul and that best, they could only expect to hold out until mid-May. Busan wasn't much better either, which is where Hideyoshi would land. The letter also said that the best that they could hope for was to, was to wait for the Korean harvest, take it, and then reassess the situation there at that time. All the daimyo, or lords, signed their names on this, including Kobiakawa Takakage and Kato Kiyomasa, which were easily some of the most hawkish commanders in the Japanese army. Of course, with all the commanders now understanding the situation, the only thing left was to leave Seoul. So Commander Kanishi Yukinaga sent a message north to the Ming commander-in-chief, Li Rusong, letting him know that they wanted to negotiate. And Li would have wanted the same thing, and sent an envoy with the demand that they should also evacuate the city of Seoul, and then they could work out the details of a settlement. Toyotomi Hideyoshi's commanders wrote to him, telling him of the plan, and that the Ming were willing to reach a settlement. But just like in the pre-war missions at the beginning of this series, these were altered by Hideyoshi's staff into a message that he would want to hear. The way he heard it was that at the Battle of Byokjigwan, the Ming were severely crippled, and because of this, they were ready to make concessions, and that moving the army south was just simply a sign of good faith. Hideyoshi was definitely the kind of man that preferred to negotiate instead of battle, especially if he thought that he could still reach his goal in the end. So he wrote back to his commanders that they had his permission to go ahead with the withdrawal. At the time that this was happening, the Korean King Sanjo and the rest of his government left Uiju and began the long journey back to Seoul, which would actually take about six months. But we'll talk about that more next time. Thank you for watching, and if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, and more importantly, hit that like button, and I'll see you next time.